Hello and welcome to Views from the Top. I'm Sarah Allen and today I'm joined by Ben Griffiths. Ben is the co-founder, managing director and senior portfolio manager for the Ely Griffiths Group. Ely Griffiths Group is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, which is no small feat when you think about the market cycles we've been through in that time. Today we're going to discuss how to invest through different market cycles, where we are in the cycle and where Ben sees the opportunities in small and mid-cap companies. Ben, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure, Sarah. Nice to be here. So, to begin with, congratulations on the 20th anniversary. Thank you. Now, you started out in the third year of the dot-com bear rally, which is a pretty difficult time to be starting. Can you discuss some of the challenges that you went through at the time? Yes, it was. It was every bit um, a harrowing time. Um, as you, you may recall, or perhaps you're too young to recall, but the, um, some of the real-world ructions were extraordinary. You had SARS, you had the second invasion or the second Gulf War. Um, you had the Iranian earthquake that, that killed a large number of people. There was a lot of tumult in the world. And financial markets weren't spared either. So there was chaos. And, and I recall when Brian Ely and I struck out and said, let's do our, let's set this thing up. There were a, a lot of doubting Thomases that basically said, bad time to start. Don't you know markets are going lower? Don't you know the whole thing's destined to, 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 to trade into, um, into, into uh, much lower levels? And I remember thinking at the time, was a bit of a lesson, is that there's never a good time or never a bad time to launch forward with a business. You do it when you're right, when you're confident, and you think you can do a good job. So on the basis of that logic, we set forth. In your 20 years with Ely Griffiths Group, you've seen a lot of market cycles. What do you see as the factors for success in investing during different market cycles? Yeah, well, I mean, as every cycle is different. They are, however, they do boil down to a couple of common elements. And, and one is a discussion about valuation and a discussion about sentiment. And in every situation, a cycle will peak on a, on a valuation that's overstretched to the upside with um, ebullient and exuberant uh, sentiment. And equally, a cycle will bottom in, in times of um, despair when valuations contract and when investor sentiment is, um, is, is very negative. Uh, you have very poor animal spirits. And if I can just share an example, I think the, the global financial crisis in 2009 is a great example where markets had had a very buoyant time up until pretty well December 2007, and then they began to unravel into a very pronounced down leg or economic contraction. And I recall the cycle at that stage, um, wondering when, when will we know the cycle lowers in? When will you know that? And I think the two things, as I just referenced before, that we, we held on to was one was that valuations had contracted and I took a call from a, a private investor who rang up and was inquiring about three stocks we, he we held in large quantity and wanted to buy them and I said look I'm sorry sir we, we deal through stockbrokers we don't deal directly with corporates um, but can I ask what's your fixation with these two these three businesses and why are you calling me today and he said well I can just tell you one simple thing valuations and the listed market are now cheaper than valuations in the real world out there. And of course, that absolutely nearly always doesn't happen. Listed market valuations tend to be higher than the outside world or unlisted valuations. So you had the complete reverse of the valuation methodology where stocks were trading cheaper than, 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 than real world businesses. That, was a, that for me was a bell, a bell ringing moment that uh, valuations have reached rock bottom. It's, it's time to start thinking about buying. And at the same time, talking to people, you couldn't find a person you couldn't find a person in Pitt Street Mall or Hunter Street for that matter that would say, yeah, I'm buying stocks. Um, I, I, it's time to get the portfolio filled. So you had the extremities and that's what you get in cycles. And so, and markets, um, uh, markets are based around cycles, the yin and the yang. And so we need to make sure that at the appropriate times, we've either got a bit of cash to take advantage of a cycle low or we're responding to valuation and we start pruning the portfolio when valuations are toppy and sentiment is run wild. And that's what you often get at the top. Okay, and where are we in the cycle right now? I thought you might ask that. When you look at the cycle, you can look at it in a couple of perspectives. You look at the real world economic cycle, which would suggest that we are on the, on the cusp, of, cusp of recession. That's certainly um, um, how the commentators would have you believe. If you look at it, in and I'll discuss that a bit more in a second. And if you look at it in terms of the market cycle, and remember there are two different things. There's the economic cycle that plays, and there's the market cycle, which is always preempting and presaging activity. It looks ahead. 
And I think the economic cycle goes, sorry, the market cycle goes through four stages as attributed to uh, John Templeton. It goes through pessimism, scepticism, optimism and euphoria. And I think with a market cycle hat on, I'd be thinking that we're in the sceptical or the scepticism stage of the market. Okay, I think we're pessimistic. I think we're more, we're, there's more sceptics around about the impact that higher rates are going to have on investment and consumption and so on. We're not yet optimistic and we're a long way from euphoric. So I think in that cycle setting, we're sort of, we're through the bottoming stage and, the, and we're now into, a, into a, we're trying to get out of a sceptic stage in the market. And in the economic setting, I think the market, as I mentioned before, commentators are telling you we're going to soft or hard land at some combination of the two. It's interesting, I had a, a meeting this morning with Michael Knox, who's the economist at Morgan Stockbrokers in Brisbane, and he said, we're not going to have a recession in the US. The recession didn't happen, and that's because, simply because um, um, the US government has been spending and they've been growing their budget deficit substantially. And that enormous demand um, stimulant has meant that the US economy will get through without recession. That's an interesting comment. It's an interesting observation from, from Michael, and it, it, it went some way to explaining to me why yield curves, which are the great indicator of, as, as yield curves invert, we know we're moving into a recession type footing, and that's reason for concern. But yield curves now have started to disinvert, as they, uh, it's a terrible word, but they're disinverting or they're starting to steepen again. So if we're going into a steepening scenario, and that's been happening since early May, mid-May, that process, that's almost the professional market saying, I think the recession concerns have been overplayed. I think we're actually, there's enough ingredients in place to suggest that the, the economy, the US economy, won't go into a hard landing. It'll be a very, very modest landing. And GDP will print positively in the, uh, in, in the first quarter of next year, or fourth quarter of this year and first quarter of next year, suggesting that we're not going to go into uh, recessed conditions. And the other thing I'm quite heartened about where we are in the cycle right now is um, people don't pay a lot of attention to the S&P earnings series, certainly not people in this country. In the US, they're obsessed with quarterly earnings. But I think you'll find that the US market since about March this year has been in upgrade mode. So we've had Q2 earnings came out well and were upgraded. Q3 earnings have been upgraded. Q4 and expectations for the whole of 24 have also been lifted. So Wall Street is starting to think the same way as Dr. Um, Doc, Dr. Knox, and, and that is that we probably, we may just get through without a recession. So there's a bit of confidence around. So it feels to me like the worst is perhaps in the rear view mirror, and that markets have got a bit of that sniff right now, uh, you either expressed in bond market traders and with, with yield curves, um, uh, or, or, um, or just the man on the street, and I saw some recent equity inflow data that suggested money's flowing back into mutual funds, both bond and equities. So where are we in the cycle? I think we're off the bottom. I think the economic backdrop is looking slightly more constructive than it did 12 months ago. And that's what's getting people a little bit excited that maybe we're going a bit higher here. Okay, so on the note of optimism, we've had a few fund managers say to us that now is the time for buying small caps. Do you agree with that and where are you seeing some of the opportunities? Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. And you're probably thinking he would say that, but I agree with it um, simply because small cap P ratio is at a, about an 8 or 9% discount to the, the big cap equivalent. Um, so they're, they're trading at cheaper prices than the big caps, yet the big cap industrials will struggle to post any earnings growth in, in 24, whereas the small cap part of the market will probably do between 10 and 15% earnings growth. So you're getting stocks that are kind of on sale, but they're offering far superior growth outcomes for next year. So I think the fundamental base case is these stocks are cheap. They're cheap, they're priced cheaply for the growth we think they're going to deliver. Another reason I think small caps look interesting is they've kind of been neglected somewhat. Um, they've been cast aside. They've been chronic underperformers versus mid caps versus big caps since about December 21. So they've been panned and they've been shunned and there's that sentiment thing coming back where the interest is not there. And I think uh, when you can show me a valuation case, as I mentioned, uh, discount PEs, and you can show me there's earnings growth coming through and there's a lot of disinterest from investors, then that tells me that um, small caps are a good place to be. Okay, any particular that you like in the moment? Plenty, can't lift the skirt um, too high on this show, Sarah, um, but there's a, there's a number of stocks and clearly we, we like, there's a number of um, resource names um, 
in the energy space that we like. Um, we're fans of um, Paladin and we're fans of, uh, of Karoon Energy. Mm -hmm. So we've been big, big, big believers in where the oil price is going. There's a number of good quality industrial names that we like and, and um, as you might expect, uh, you know, Breville Group. Um, we've got some Fisher and Paykel Healthcare we like. Um, we have some Ridley and we have some Sightminder. So there's a number of stocks that aren't necessarily to be pigeonholed into sectors, yeah. but there's a good cross-section. We've, we've, we've seen quite a bit of value develop and we've taken advantage of that over the last, the last several months. Okay. You mentioned a couple of resources names in there. Now, I know you've been fairly bullish on resources and commodities in the yeah. past. Are you still fairly bullish in, this, in these areas going forward? And um, any particular commodities that you well, like? Well, constructive rather than bullish. I think that the, the, the backdrop, the, the, the fundamental supply demand um, um, ratios for most base metals are unbelievable right now in terms of being undersupplied and, and, and demand remains fairly buoyant. You see in the oil market as well, demand is strong. Uh, um, I think average daily demand over 106, 110 million barrels of oil. Those estimates were what the market was pencilling in, I think in about um, five years time. We're now seeing the demand levels today. So um, we like the outlook for the oil market and, and by virtue of that, the, the gas market as well. And of course the uranium market. And we've seen that, we've seen that perform very strongly. A number of stocks, there aren't a lot of stocks in, in the Australian market to get exposure there. Um, but uranium generally has, has performed well. And those stocks have also come into their own. So um, certainly materials and energy um, sector generally, but specific, there are stories within that. We don't go hunting for sectors, we go hunting for stocks. And the outworking is a sectoral representation. We've got a few Genesis Minerals, which of course is a, is a great emerging gold play in WA. And we're very familiar with Raleigh and his team who are doing an extraordinary job. They've had a few headwinds to navigate. Um, um, and we've navigated them with him, but we're pretty, we feel pretty good about the prospects for that group, as we do for Capricorn as well. So Capricorn Minerals is another, another, another gold stock that we own in the portfolio. So we've got not a, not a, not a, not a sort of throw a blanket over approach. We've got a very specific um, portfolio construction methodology. So yeah, that's how we're thinking about it. We're not getting too far ahead of ourselves. It's a very commodity specific thing. We're aware of the powerhouse that is China and the issues they're having up there. Um, but demand still, I mean, as, as much as they've got issues below the surface, there's still plentiful demand for infrastructure projects up in China. So um, constructive rather than bullish for now, and probably turn bullish at some point, as we see China enjoy some stimulus and start to recover more, 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 uh, more officially. Okay. So I'm going to turn to the fact that you're in the process of launching a mid-cap strategy. Why do you see this as a natural progression for the firm? Oh, it's a natural progression because I don't know, for 28 of the 50 stocks that live in that mid-cap space, we've owned previously. So we have a good working knowledge. We've got files on them that just probably need to be updated. Um, but certainly we can see that, um, that, that, that uh, we know the business as well. Um, I guess it's a time-honoured observation that mid-cap stocks tend to be among the sweeter performers in the Australian share market. It's a great hunting ground. The space tends to be underserved by managers. There aren't a huge number of managers who, who get down in the weeds in that part of the market. We've been doing it for years, so it's a natural for us. And my strategist at work, Peter Stoltz, um, drew my attention to an interesting um, data point uh, the other day. He said that the, the, the mid-cap P ratio is, has derated by about 45% from where it was in November 20, down to around 15 and a half times. 15 and a half times brings you bang in line with the top 50 stocks. So you're paying the same sort of rating and the same sort of PE ratio for the top 50, yet the growth prospects for mid cap stocks are far, far superior than those that live in the, in the, in the top 50. So there's a very obvious, and normally, normally the, normally the premium that as a mid cap player, you pay a 10% premium to the, to the big end, and now they're trading at parity at the same, same PE ratio. So we think they're fundamentally cheap. We think they're, they're fundamentally under, underserviced or looked after or managed um, in a portfolio sense. And we think there's a, there's a great opportunity for us to extend our expertise um, and start building some portfolios around these names. And traditionally, as a small cap manager, we've had to release these stocks to the market because they become a little bit too big for us. We now have the receptacle or the fund to, to capture those stocks and then nurse them through to their ultimate conclusion which in many cases is top 50, top 20 inclusion, um, 
And if we can be on stocks like that, um, we've done our job. That's our job is to, is, to, is to hold and nurture and identify value and good quality businesses. So that's why we're doing it. Are there any stocks that you've released in the past that you're looking forward to bringing back to the portfolio? There's a, there's a good number and we've got a, um, a, uh, a great team uh, up at Ely Griffiths Group pouring over the sort of members or the stocks that should be a part of the portfolio. Um, look, there's two that we're very fond of. There's two that we have a very long history with um, that, that um, again, I'm lifting the skirt a bit because we haven't bought them yet, but we're for the, for the new fund, of course. But, but um, a, a stock like car sales and a stock like a company like Worley uh, would be two great examples of fully fledged mid caps who, um, who are about the same size, about nine or 10 bill in market cap. Um, two very different businesses. Well, one's, a, one's a, an online marketplace for motor vehicles and the other clearly is a oil and gas and renewable energy construction group. Both those businesses are very well managed. Uh, we're familiar with the management teams. They have great earnings prospectivity. Um, they've got, a, they've got f uh, in the case of Worley, has a great order book. There's a lot going on there. And car sales is prosecuting a great business that, um, that's, that's, been, that's been in formation for a long time. Well, we owned it when it debuted, when it first came onto the market. We owned it for a long time and we've, and we've since now cast our affections back to it. So there's, there's two names, for instance, that, yeah. that many of the, the viewers would be across and would be, would be uh, familiar with. And we think they've, they're outstanding names. Okay. What's one thing that you've become privy to recently that you wouldn't have come across had it not been for your experience and your position at the moment? That is, what's your view from the top? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, look, I think my view from the top is that Experience counts for plenty um, in, 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 in stock markets and stock market investing. Um, it helps to have participated in a few cycles to know uh, when you see value, staring at the face, what you've got to do about it. Um, I think the fact that we are, um, I think, as a group, um, so well integrated into small and mid-cap land corporately, um, I think our, our insights and our, and our conviction around our positions is strong. I think um, my, my, my view from the top is one of relative confidence with things, um, with where the economy is heading. Um, and, and I'm sufficiently confident that we'll be able to find um, uh, oversold gems, um, unloved, unloved pets, um, call them what you like in the marketplace. We think, um, we think we'll do a good job of finding them. And that's, that's, that's the business we've always been in, is, is finding diamonds in the rough and, and, and so on. Um, but I think that's what, we, that's what we'll do. Um, and I think that's something that this team, our team, which is very established and stable, um, has, in, uh, has in spades. We have, have the ability to parlay experience and put it to work. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today, Ben. Thanks, Sarah. And if you've enjoyed that episode of Views from the Top, please subscribe to both Market Index and Livewire Markets. Thank you for watching.